We talk a lot about generative modeling on this podcast, at least since episode 6 with Michael Betancourt. And an area where this way of modeling is particularly useful is healthcare, as Maria Scularidu will tell us in this episode. Maria is a final year PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Her thesis is focused on probabilistic machine learning and more precisely towards using generative modeling in, you guessed it, healthcare. But her fields of interest are diverse, from theory and methodology of machine intelligence to Bayesian inference, from theoretical computer science to information theory, Maria is knowledgeable in a lot of topics, and that's why I also had to ask her about mixture models, category of model that she uses frequently. Prior to her PhD, Maria studied computer science and statistical science at Athens University of Economics and Business. She's also invested in several efforts to bring more diversity and accessibility in the data science world. And when she's not working on all this, you'll find her playing the nay, trekking, or rowing. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 62, recorded May 4th, 2022. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbaysestats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbaysestats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbaystance.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hello my dear patients today i have the pleasure of welcoming janine sue to the lbs family janine has subscribed to the brand new good patient tier on the lbs patreon which means that in three months you will get a very special merch item delivered right to your door janine but most importantly, thanks a lot for your support. It really helps making this show possible. And speaking of the show, it must go on. So let's talk about healthcare modeling with Maria Scularidu. Maria Scularidu, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. I'm really happy to have you on the show and so many things to discuss with you. As usual, let's start with your background. Basically, what is your origin story, Maria? How did you come to the stats and data world? And like, was it a serious or a straight path? Yeah, it was definitely not a straight path. As a teenager, I loved biology. I used to think that I would probably study clinical medicine. But then I realized that that's something that I cannot do. I loved biology and math. So I ended up doing a diploma in computer science because that's where you do proper maths in Greece. And then uh, during uh, that diploma, I got the theoretical computer science stream and the mathematical stream. We had to pick two of them and through them got introduced into the amazing, extraordinary world of uh, probability and of complexity. So through probability, I was led, then I was introduced to Bayesian statistics. So that's why statistics. And, but I still, you know, it's like uh, having your feet on two different boats. I love stats and probability theory, but I also love 
theoretical computer science, uh, algorithmic complexity, information theory, you know, these kind of things. And I'm very glad because now I'm doing a PhD on kind of a combination of these two. So I'm using my background from computer star science and I also use uh, statistical methods in order to improve, let's say, our methods in healthcare. So with applications to healthcare. That's, uh, you know, a very vague, <laughs> let's say, uh, background. So yeah, quite uh, picky. Also, it, after pursuing my master's, I was not sure that I should proceed with a PhD. I, I wasn't feeling, you know, the imposter syndrome thing. I wasn't feeling good enough. So I was a researcher for four years, I think, and two very Bayesian projects. So I mean, I think that I've only had one project that had nothing to do with Bayesian statistics. All of them, the rest of them are all Bayesians. Speaking of uh, awesome Bayesian stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, I see. That's interesting. I mean, serious path are definitely, I find more interesting than very straight path. Well, I admire both. You know, some people, they just know. Yeah, but then it sounds so strange to me. And I'm curious, so you spoke about Bayes already, we'll come back to that, but like, can you, can you define what you're doing nowadays? Because like you do a lot of things. So can you tell us what you're doing basically? And also what topics you are particularly interested in? Well, to be honest, I enjoy weeds as much as depth. So sometimes I travel from project to project that they totally, that stem totally from different backgrounds. For example, at the moment, a joint work of mine is under review and it's about neuroscience and information theory. And at the very same time, I'm on doing generative adversarial networks and learning theory in this aspect. So these are two totally disjoint things, but I'm very happy to doing both of them. And well, there is a common space. There's a, the joint thing amongst whatever I do is that it is applied to healthcare because I really wish that we can help towards improving this particular aspect. So, for example, neuroscience is an aspect of healthcare in extent. So, because what we do has got uh, is going to have an impact there. So, yeah, whatever I do has got these type of applications. But the way that I'm tackling each and every problem is uh, totally different. So information theory uh, from the lens of uh, sun on entropy and uh, joint entropy. And then on the other hand, it's yeah, generative adversarial networks, huge deep neural nets, big data. And yeah, because that's another thing for some problems, we have very small data sets, for example, rare diseases. And for other problems, we have massive data sets. So you need to adjust with respect to what you have and to use the tools that you have in your arsenal. So, you know, that's why I enjoyed WIF again, because you get to have more tools. Yeah, I see. Definitely. And also you have this background in kind of more math and biostatistics, basically. Yes. Which helps you have that depth of different topics. Yes, because biostat, it's by default, whenever you want to deal with Biostats in Cambridge is uh, based in the School of Clinical Medicine and there's a particular reason why, because you actually need to understand what the biological problem is. I mean, we are mathematicians, statisticians, uh, I don't know, computer scientists, but the problem that we are trying to solve is a biological or a healthcare problem. So we need to communicate with these people. We need to understand their language to transform, translate, convert whatever they do in our set up and then try to solve the problem. So yeah, also you need to study as well. For example, when it comes to neuroscience, I studied a lot, quite a lot regarding neurology, for example. And it's interesting because you get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, it's these kind of things in, in life where it's, um, I don't know what I'm doing, but I like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's amazing. I have no idea, but it's super cool. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I still remember the face of the neurologist when I told him something and he was like, you have no idea what you have just said. And I was like, in terms of maths, I do. In terms of your, you know, of neurology, your game, I have no idea. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I completely relate. And so 
Actually, if we de-zoom a little, can you define your main field for listeners and also tell us why Bayes would be useful in this field? Well, what I do, my PhD is on uh, probabilistic machine learning with applications to healthcare. So why what probabilistic machine learning is that it's actually machine learning with uncertainty. So we introduce the notion of uncertainty because usually we go by the mean. We do not really understand that uh, something might vary and actually it might vary quite a lot. So that's why I'm trying to, uh, whichever method I use, I try to explain that what is the expectation and how much this is, uh, whether that's a proxy and how good a proxy it is to the uh, truth that we never know, that we have modeled, but we do not really know. So that pretty much, you know, that's quite interesting and from a philosophical point of view that things happen in the world. We try to model them. The way we model them is simply a model. It's not what actually happens. And then we try to approximate the model, which is a proxy to the reality. So there's a double in-between process there. And that's why Bayes is important, because we might have a prior belief about something, then we are fed and we think that there's a model that actually generates the reality, let's say, and we have our prior belief, and then we go through the model and our prior belief changes to the posterior. And that's, from a philosophical point of view, that's interesting because you might have whichever prior belief for whatever thing and then you experience and then after the experience, usually you get to change. So that's why I like Bayes. I find it philosophically very appealing. And also, I don't want to go into this discussion, but it's also the right approach as compared to the frequentists. We know that there are some paradoxes there. So, But yeah, I like the idea that you might not know beforehand. Yeah. So you might use an, a totally uniform prior or you might have some very, you know, you might know something and go towards there and from the beginning, but yeah. you always start from a point and you end up in a different one most, most of the times. I see. Yeah. So that makes me think like how, how got you got introduced to Bayesian methods. So you said, because like you said, you use them all the time Yes. and you love the philosophical framework, but how did you get introduced to them in the first place? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah of course, it was uh, through a course of probability theory, elementary probability theory back in my diploma years. So it was year two, if I remember correctly. And at the beginning, we had probability and combinatorics at the beginning of the course, and then it was Bayesian theory. So it was, you know, you, you can understand. It was a great fit, and it was also quite, the introduction was amazing. And the fact that, for example, this the instructor, he was very passionate also about uh, Bayesian methods. And he just used a very simple example of, for example, you know, uh, people use condoms, but do you actually know with what probability the condom is going to uh, not to work? And that really got people's attention. And they were like, whoa, we need to, whoa, <laughs> we need to attend this course because uh, if you calculate uh, the prior of uh, having a mis of uh, an error and the prior of, uh, and then the fact that the conditional probability that what you use is actually not the right material, then it turns out to a different probability as compared to the one given in the box. So that got people interested. <laughs> and yeah. I was one of them, uh, not because of this example, but yeah. yeah. And then he explained uh, several other things like how important statistics is and stuff like that. So after this course, I was totally into stats. So sometimes the instructor does play a very, very important role. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. That's actually interesting because you're one of the only guests who have been formally introduced to Bayesian stats during their master curriculum, basically. And it's not that surprising in the, so far as like you did study probabilistic machine learning. So there is probability in the name. Yes. So once you know that, it's less surprising that you did study that formally. But that's still rare and in the sense that it's mainly taught in those very 
niche curriculum. Yeah. Whereas not like for most of the people not doing that, they are not introduced formally to these kind of tests. So actually we were introduced to Bayesian theory not during the masters, but during the diploma. It's not a bachelor, it's four year diploma of computer science. So that was even right. before that. Okay. Even before yeah, even better. Yes. Nice. That's why I got into statistics and that's why then I did the masters. Nice. Okay. So the path to where you are right now is seniors, but the path to Bayesian stat is actually quite clear and direct, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I see. And in, and in comparison, so you use Bayesian stats whenever you can. How frequent is the use of Bayesian stats in your field in general? Well, I love Bayesian stats, but we do know that now that we have big data, we cannot really use the methods that we used to love and methods that used to work so nicely and smoothly. So, I mean, it's just computationally not, it's not going to happen. It will going to die in the, and it's going to keep running and trying to find a, a, a local optimum. So, uh, for example, we do know that MCMC is Markov chain Monte Carlo is uh, slow, reversible jumps are slow as well. So what we used to use Bayesian stats, we and there are some people uh, actually at the moment, it's Sylvia Richardson, Gareth Roberts, Professor Sylvia Richardson, Professor Gareth Roberts, Professor Paul Fernhead, and other professors from across the UK who try to make Bayesian methods tractable in uh, big data. They try to make them scale with respect to big data so that they can uh, actually tackle this kind of problem. So. All, I guess that all I'm trying to say is that whenever we have small data, we'd rather go with Bayesian methods. Whenever we have big data, we need to adjust and use other type of things. We try to employ Bayesian methods within the, um, the framework as uh, Zubin Agravani, for example, did with respect to dropout, for example, a method that we use in the neural network. So there is some local research, let's say, with respect to some of the steps that we use. Yeah. But overall, we cannot really do that because of computational aspects. I see. Yeah, that definitely is still a limitation sometimes. Yes. And, and I love them. I mean, I still love them. If I could, I would definitely go for something like that. But I know that the computer will never gonna stop running. Yeah, it's something we work on also quite a lot at PyMC Labs, so the company I work at. And like, definitely we've had some huge speed ups now with new development of backends like Dumba and Jax and the fact that you can use that in PyMC version 4. Like definitely that's more and more doable. And so that's very encouraging to me because like, for instance, we've had sometimes models in the millions of data points with thousands of parameters and we've managed to feed that with a fully Bayesian model. So that's amazing. That's definitely doable. Yeah. That's less, less easy than when you have small data, of course, but I think we're getting there and I'm quite confident that it should be easier and easier, especially as those framework interact better with each other, which is also one of the goals of PyMC4. Yeah, I agree so too. I'm very optimistic about Bayesian methods being used in big data as well. I know that Arnaud Doucet has been doing a great work on that as well. Uh, with, uh, I mean, there are methods that you can use. You can keep on uh, getting sub samples of your sample that they are going, that they are back with replacement, for example, and uh, make doing things in parallel. So this way, instead of having endpoints, you might have just a very very small subset of that, and then just work in parallel. So in this way, you do get to. Well, but on the other hand, you get to speed things up. But on the other hand, each method has got, uh, again, need to do the algorithmic complexity analysis and to find the bottleneck. And sometimes the bottlenecks, uh, when it comes to Bayesian statistics, the bottlenecks can be exponential with respect to parameter space. So then you know that you are stuck and that you need to change method. Either to improve the actual one, that's why I said that MCMC cannot really work with uh, many parameters or or with many observations. I mean, it can, but... Uh, yeah, it depends. <laughs> like, it's like, but it's more intricate. Yeah. Like, definitely the example I gave was with full MCMC, but it's more, it's still, like, let's say it's at the frontier of the development of these methods, so the uncertainty is higher. Yes, <laughs> you see, uncertainty. But I think it, it is getting smaller. Yes. 
there have been some improvements. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, what type of, like, in which field or kind of projects do you mainly have big data and in which fields and kind of project you mainly have small data? Are those like very different or like is it pretty, like you cannot really make that kind of categorization? Well, the, in the UK, we've got the UK Biobank which is at the moment it has got, if I'm not mistaken, 500,000 people uh, where they have too many variables actually with respect to each person. You might find um, CTs, uh, genotypes, SMP. You could find, yeah, there are too many millions of variables. Okay, so that's, these are electronic healthcare records and we would like to use that in order to do the so-called personalized medicine. So. You know, we would like to be able to process all this data and find uh, subclusters and then identify whether a person is could be part of a particular subcluster so that doctors could prescribe them um, particular meds or could ask for a particular test so that the patient gets better sooner or something like that. So in this setup, the data are data from respect to parameter space they are huge with respect to observation space, very large. Now, with respect to the problem that I was dealing with, and I mentioned of a neuroscientific problem, we have 32 observations and the 4,000, we have 32 people with 4,000, it's a time, they are time series with the 4,000 time points, for example, and that's for two variables. So that's definitely a small data set. And back in the day, I mean, in 92, they would say when they started the amazing uh, Bayesian idea, Adrian Smith, they might say that for, because they were using longitudinal data at this particular paper for uh, rats and they had five observations. Now we have 4,000 observations. They might have said that that's not doable, but today it's a piece as people would say. So back to the discussion that we had before, things that look computationally intractable at the moment, they might not be in, well, it's been three decades before, but let's say that now that's not the rate. So let's say that in five years, it's going to be a totally okay. So we fiddle with small data set, large data sets, big data, and uh, with respect to the problem, we use uh, different methods. It's not, as if, it's not as if you have one method that kills everything. It's like, I don't like this uh, sort of, per of perspectives. Yeah, definitely. Completely agree. So that that's why I'm asking you that question. Yeah, it's because like that way you can understand in which fields you would be most advantaged using this kind of generative modeling and using domain knowledge. Yeah, definitely. And speaking about that, by the way, like because you do work a lot on generative modeling, actually, especially in healthcare. So can you take an example from your work to illustrate the kind of work you do? So I'm um, very interested in generative adversarial networks that they were developed by Ian Goodfellow. I'm trying to recall the, I think it's 2014, it was 2014. So that, it's more like a phenomenon. They have uh, hundreds of thousands of citations, if I'm not mistaken. So, well, too many citations. Well, the idea of a GAN is that GAN is a generative process. When uh, you have a GAN, a generative adversarial network uh, trained, then in principle, you can draw samples from the actual distribution. So say that you have a data set, you train this black box that is called GAN, and once this thing is trained, then you get to draw samples from this particular, from the actual generative process that has actually, that, uh, has, that the data originate from, that the real data originate from. So the continuous real data. So that, to begin with, that was the, and the idea is that you have, uh, there are two networks, two functions, you can consider them of whatever, of whatever, that they are adversarial. So once the one wants to trick the other one, so there's a generator and the discriminator and the generator wishes to learn how to generate, uh, it has got as input noise and it wishes to learn how to generate samples that are close to, the, to 
that those that the actual line distribution would generate and a discriminator wishes to tell whether the input is fake or whether the input is uh, indeed one of the observed data that an observed that one of the data that we have and so discriminator wishes to maximize the probability and the, the generator wishes to minimize this probability so there's a min max game here they have the it's a zero something because they have the same utility function that means that implies nice things with respect to game theory back to computer science things that i used to like and so now i'm in this uh, nice position that i can fiddle again with uh, my background i wish to employ the generative adversarial networks well generative adversarial networks have been used mostly for images and for videos for this type of data so they've been using nice neural nets like uh, the convolutional neural net most of the times and then when it gets to video RNNs. so um, a couple of years ago together with Lei Xu and other fellows from MIT then we developed a GAN a generative adversarial network that can actually take us a put tabular data i.e data that can be either continuous or discrete and still generate something. Because when you generate images, you can start drawing things and tell whether your samples looks like an image or not, right? You use uh, the visual fidelity as a measure of evaluation. When you draw patients, how can you tell whether that would be, you know, a patient or not? Then the task of evaluation is much, much harder. So um, that's part of uh, my PhD, how to evaluate, uh, because that's an open problem, actually. It was uh, um, Thais has introduced that in 2015, that with respect to a metric, your gun might do an amazing job, and with respect to another metric, your gun might, be, might generate garbage. Yeah. So we need to stabilize that, and we need to have an understanding and a measure of how to evaluate the GANs and whether the GANs work or not with respect, each and every time with respect to a particular task. So that's part of my PhD. So employing GANs and evaluating them in the context of electronic healthcare records. Nice. Okay. Yeah, fascinating. So why, concretely, why would a GAN be interesting in healthcare modeling? When would that be useful? For too many reasons, actually, to be honest, because in electronic healthcare records, we have the, not the problem, the intriguing aspect of privacy. So you do not really get to give away data sets that this each and every data point is on the records of a particular person. So you'd rather generate from whichever distribution could generate these data points and give some other data points that are not human beings, if you see what I mean. So instead of giving the real, the actual data, which is something sacred, actually, you don't get to, well, there are all these uh, rules now about GDPR or something like that, about the preve uh, data privacy, and we do not want our data to be given away or people to fiddle with uh, our personal things. Instead of doing that, we train a model and we generate data and no one touches the actual data set, but they can have access to the simulated ones. I see. So that's one of the reasons, yeah. Okay, but then is the model used for diagnostics or things like that, or it's only on these kind of simulated data? No, no, that's one, just one aspect. I'm just saying that a person could use them, could use that instead of using an actual data set. Another thing is that when, especially in statistics, we have this amazing huge gap. So we develop a model. When we want to test that, we simulate from the moment from the model. We gen so we generate data with respect to the model, and we test the model. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then we try to we try to fit the model to the real data, and everything falls apart because the simulated data and the real data are so far away. So another thing that GANs could be useful for is that to, to generate data that are closer to reality so that models can be more challenged and so that models can be better. Models that have uh, already developed models that don't really work. So that's another thing actually not challenge invite people to think that you know if your model works well in your simulated data and doesn't work well in the real data how about 
pushing it a bit further by using some, instead of simulating data, some other type of data, like the ones generated by guns. And people can also use that. That's my postdoc problem in order for imputation reasons as well. So in sometimes you might have something, you might not have something else. So you, this, the thing that you do not have, you generate it with guns and you continue so that you can have tabular data again, instead of having data with, instead of having tables with uh, empty rows or uh, empty columns. I see. Okay, of course, if the row is, the whole row is empty, all the whole column is empty, then we can, we can do nothing. But you see what I'm saying, some bits and points might not be there. Yeah. And so, so I see it's kind of like a layer cake where it's more useful like in upstream before statistical models that are already in use, but that would be made even better if before working on those models, we used GANs to generate the data that those models would work on. Yes, yes, that's an idea of mine. I think that that would actually be helpful. Okay. And how does Bayesian stats fit into that? Do you use Bayesian statistics here to feed those GANs? And if yes, how how do they help? No, actually, there has been an effort of, GA, of uh, Bayesian GANs, but I'm not sure whether that was completed. Because in GANs, you see at the end of the day, you do not have the distribution. You can generate from the distribution in principle, but you do not have a distribution. So at the moment, we do not really explicitly use Bayesian statistics in this framework. I see. People have tried that, but the idea is that GANs are um, distribution free. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of almost contradicted. <laughs> but one could do that, but... I don't know. It's like using a totally different thing, totally different tool. I see. So yeah, that's interesting because I never covered GANs on the, on the podcast. And if we go back to the Bayesian framework, I know you also work quite a lot on Bayesian mixtures. So we did speak a bit about that already on the podcast, but not a lot. So can you tell us what mixture models are? and what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Okay, so my supervisor is Sylvia Richardson. Sylvia, together with a colleague of her, had developed actually the first Bayesian mixture uh, model, right? Using um, reversible down MCMC. But that was a univariate. That was only for one variable. Then uh, my master's supervisor, Petros de Loportas, the colleague of her, of his, sorry, had developed how to use Bayesian mixture models to, for more than one dimension. And they could extend that up to five dimensions because actually there was some closed form things that you had to write them down explicitly. I was part of, I mean, then I checked that problem. So... Then there are the Dirichlet mixture models that when you are in this space, you have no problem with respect to the variance. So you can be multivariate and you can have several clusters across uh, each and every variable. But you pay that at the po on the cost of, on a polynomial cost, if I remember correctly, because I did the algorithmic analysis. So in the univariate space, our um, reversible jam MCMC is faster as compared to mixture digital process, but that's only in the univari univariate space. But once you move to the multivariate space, then you need to rely on the Dirichlet processes. Dirichlet processes, they are great. I mean the multivariate model. They are great, but they do also have the tendency to create more clusters as compared to reality, for example, if I remember correctly. And they were supposed to be quite slow, but that's why I've been writing a paper that I need, had to, I need to write up my thesis, so I've, it's on pause at the moment. But there has been some great advances on the topic by a fellow named Chang, who actually developed a very, very fast multivariate uh, Dirichlet processes that uh, using base, Bayesian methods that can actually fit nicely to big data sets. Yeah, so... 
Uh, definitely, if you can add those links in the show notes for listeners who are interested, that would be awesome. Hopefully, I will upload also the, the paper on the what and stuff about it regarding the, these models. Because at the beginning, so my supervisor, Petros, told me just use uh, a method. And I was like, uh, but there are two. He told me use one of them. And I could not, you, you cannot, I felt that I cannot randomly select. There has to be the best one. I really need to use the best one. So I started comparing uh, the pros and cons of Sylvia's method. Let's call it Sylvia's method. And the other guy, actually, I think it was uh, Garth Roberts and Omeros Papaspilopoulos. So there were very sophisticated statisticians around the methods that they were developed. Back in the day, but that started in 2000. Then there were some developments in 2003, 2006, and then I think that people stopped worrying about that at 2010. I think, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I'm, I haven't seen a new method. I've seen people using or a bit updating a bit the old methods, but not actually. Yeah, it's less fancy. Yeah, I guess that now people have jumped to yeah. to other topics, but it's not as if the topic is dead, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, science has its fashion. Yeah, yeah. Now it's not trendy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even general relativity, uh, it was a big thing when it was out, and then for couple of years, not a lot of people paid attention to it until, I think, until the 50s or something like that. So Yes, indeed. Definitely there is fashion in science, whereas we often oppose the two. Yeah, but there are also old laws, right? Old habits die hard. So if you like something, you're go- I mean, I will never give up on MCMC, that I know. <laughs> I can do whatever, but I will definitely keep on trying to employ them sometimes just, to, you know. Well, that's great to hear. <laughs> And so, yeah, to make that clear for listeners, so what you were talking about, so directly processes, they are generalization to an infinite number of mixtures, right? Yes. So mixture models is like, you've got a mixture of distributions. So instead of having a likelihood, which is just normal, for instance, you have several normals. The finite case is like, oh yeah, I see there are five clusters in the data, but I don't know exactly where they are, but I'm going to try to fit those five clusters. Some normal distributions, yeah. but So that would be like a mixture of normals. And then you have the infinite case, which would be like, I know I have several clusters in the data, but I don't know exactly how many. So I'm not only going to infer the different clusters in the population, I'm going to also infer how many clusters there are. And you do that with direct processes. Yes. Okay. Did I make any mistake here or was that clear enough and accurate enough? No, it was clear enough. And you knew you use the Delta Dirac uh, distribution and then the, the, the point masses. I mean, I just tried not to, you know, I could write the math. So the idea is that you can actually start with a prior on the number of clusters and then you can yeah. end up with a posterior on the number of clusters. And that can happen, if I'm not mistaken, to both things, both to, with respect. Just because they use the reversible jump, they have birth and death status. So they can use the birth of a new cluster. And if this cluster stays empty for too long, then with some probability, they can kill this cluster and start a new one, someone else. So that can happen. In principle, the number of clusters can be infinite there as well. But it's just that, as you said, with respect to Bayesian method of Sylvia, uh, they use a, a mixture of normal distributions, though in the Dirichlet models, they use uh, the delta, uh, an infinite sum of delta Dirac, delta Dirac distributions. I see. Okay. But then the problem, well, the issue here is that if you need to infer the number of clusters, by definition, it's an integer. And so you cannot use nuts, the nut sampler or HMC, basically. So often you have to marginalize that thing out, if I remember correctly, and that way you use marginalized mixture models because that way you can avoid having to fit integer with MCMC and that way you can use nuts for the whole model, which makes the fitting of the model much more efficient and accurate. Is that something that rings a bell? Yeah, yeah. It, it depends on what you are eager to give away and what you would like to stick on because you can have a binomial, for example, prior and then yeah. and continue the, the inference with respect to this number as well. 
So it really depends on what you want to infer at the end of the day. Some people are sure that we have four clusters in the population, so we fix it there. Some people do not know how many clusters and they wish to know. So in this case, we have to parameterize that as well. Yeah, yeah. But that's why I often see marginalized mixture models because that you can use HMC the whole way and that makes model fitting much, much easier. Okay, yeah. Interesting. And I will have the references you talked about in the show notes. Also, I will put links to tutorials in PyMC on how to do direct lab processes and mixture models. So there are two about Gaussian mixture models and two about direct lab processes. So listeners, if you're interested in that, definitely go to the show notes and check out those links because they are really Yeah, yeah, definitely try them either way. I mean, it's amazing. And the label switching thing, the whole thing is amazing. There are going to be a lot of links. I will send you some links as well, yeah, because then it's interesting the fact that you have some clusters, but the label switching phase where whichever cluster could be whichever with anyone else, actually, because it's a weird process because I cannot really explain label switching, actually. And I remember that neither could my supervisor. So he was like, I go there, run it, and you will understand. And then you have the yeah. plot, and then you're like, now I know why, <laughs> what he meant by label switching problem. Yeah, so uh, there's going to be a tutorial, oh, uh, not a tutorial, some links on that as well. Yeah, so I think label switching is in those, in one of those notebooks I mentioned on the PyMC website. Great. Also, Osvaldo Martin, in his book for beginners, so Introduction to PyMC, has a very good example about that, about label switching in mixture models. And basically that's, if I remember correctly, when two clusters are very close, then the model can explain both of the clusters with any of those, the data with any of those two clusters. And so it can switch between the two and that's a exactly you can do the yeah and that's a problem because then you get multimodality yes and that's a big big problem for the the sampler and so the solution is to order the clusters and their probabilities because that way the model has to go to switch it has to go from one cluster to another but in order and that solves the problem so it's a very high level explanation i'm sure uh, someone very specialized in that is outraged by my explanation and i understand i'm not <laughs> specialized in that but no 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 please come on i feel like saying at the moment that we're talking about problems that literally tens or hundreds of papers have been trying to solve and we're discussing about yeah. we've been discussing about that in five minutes so of course we cannot go in depth <laughs> i mean it, it makes sense yeah exactly so go there if you're interested and in look into that yeah yeah just let's say that people please try that it's really it's a great uh, topic to dive into great topic so time is running by and i want to ask you other things a bit more general a bit less uh, intricate let's say <laughs> so i'm curious when you use the bayesian workflow currently so yeah first what's your software of choice and what do you think the biggest hurdles are currently in the bayesian workflow as i said earlier i think that especially when we use mcmc we do have the problem of uh, we do have computational problems that, that's the bottleneck we do the algorithmic complexity and we most of the times the mcmc needs polynomial time with cubic, I think, with respect to the number of parameters, and that's a problem. So uh, people, I mean, I know amazing people like Omiros Papaspiriopoulos has been dealing with this problem for quite a while now, and he has made huge progressive. I, also, Arnaud Doucet, I can send uh, the links. So those two, I know that they've done great advances towards uh, uh, employing Bayesian models and making them scalable with respect to the data. So that's uh, problem that I can see at the moment with respect to base, but I can also see that great, great uh, fellows, I cannot even call them colleagues, <laughs> they work on the topic and uh, huge. Uh, we are about to see huge advances in this regard. I mean, they've been quiet for a while, but that's just because they've been working very hard. <laughs> and then they're going to get loud again and say, you, you know, base won the, the whole thing. You know? <laughs> So that's my take, that some very, very serious people are working on the topic and BASE is going to be a computational tractable method again. And yeah, I'm curious, so how do you use usually, how do you code up your model? Like, uh, do you use already an open source package or do you do everything from scratch? I enjoy writing my own code because this way I feel that I have control 
the control, so I do not tend to use packages. But on the other hand, when, uh, for example, as I said, I had to work with some people who are not uh, computer scientists, so they do not enjoy code and we need to collaborate. So in these cases, I might use languages like R, which is an open source uh, thing with quite a lot of packages, statistical packages in there. Or, well, I don't enjoy using Python either way, so Python has got quite uh, some packages in there. But the thing is, R has, is, uh, it's way better with respect to plotting stuff. So, again, it depends on the problem. With respect to the problem, we also choose what type of language we use. And sometimes languages can uh, actually interact. So, for example, we, yeah, we can use C++ with, uh, with R, for example. That's something that I've done in the past. So with respect to code, I'm flexible. <laughs> I see, but that means you code your own MCMC samplers or you use... Yes. Oh, okay. Have you looked into the Blackjacks library? Yes. Okay, what do you think about that? I enjoy the fact that they try to, to make it quite easy and that, you know, it's um, it's like some people try to make it like a black box. So you have something and you put the data in there and it does its own MCMC and it first things. But again, I want to have my own hierarchical model where I can change a bit the priors or... I was also enjoying at the very beginning the Winbugs, the the thing that it was also de it was developed in my very own department, yeah, the biostatistics unit of Cambridge, where the Winbugs was a. Are you familiar with Winbugs? I know the framework by name. I've never used it. So it's quite it like a black box again. So you just say what is the prior. You just explain uh, in a particular uh, form the priors and the formula, and then the number of iterations that it's going to run and then after a while it generates the outcome which is that was developed in the late 80s so it was i mean you can yeah. imagine how amazing it was and they still try to keep things up so that's now the multi wing bugs which is for multi-dimensions because that was of course for one dimension one dimensional data yeah it's quite um dates back quite a lot and actually, yeah, so like just to mention Blackjacks again, because I just mentioned that on the fly. So for listeners, uh, Blackjacks is basically it's a library of samplers for jacks that works on the CPU and on the GPU. And it's designed with two categories of users in mind, let's say. So that would be like people who just need state of the art samplers that are fast and robust and well tested. So that would be nuts, HMC, things like that that you also have in PyMC, in Stan, etc. But let's say that you need a very, like you cannot use a common probabilistic programming language like PyMC. Well, then you could use, but you still need an MCMC sampler. Instead of cutting it up yourself again, you can plug the Blackjack's nuts sampler into your custom PPL, let's say. And there is another category, which would be much more like you, uh, Maria, which are researchers who can use the library's building blocks to design new algorithm. And that way you can use the building blocks that are already tested and robust and add on top of that something new yet that you are developing yourself. So that way it integrates with PPLs. As long as the PPL provide a log probability density function that's compatible with JAX. Yeah, that's one bottleneck. And the other one is that, again, that your colleagues need to be confident with the code that you provide. So sometimes that looks very delicate to them. And sometimes you have to be to write things in a cruder way, let's say. Yeah. So for listeners interested in that, I put the link to Blackjack's documentation in the show notes and also the link to the episode where we talked a bit about that with Remy Louf. How about Inla? Have you tried Inla as well? I have never tried Inla, but indeed I will link to the notes. That's another... It, that's another thing though, right? Another that's, topic. <laughs> yeah, that's like, it's not using MCMC at all, right? It's approximate, well, yeah, MCMC is approximation too, but yes, it's another type of approximation, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Integrated nested approxi uh, Laplace um, approximation. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's definitely super interesting. It's actually, a, I should do an episode about Inla actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. If you have some guest recommendations definitely yeah actually the author <laughs> yeah well perfect if you have some guest recommendations for an episode about inla like please 
send them my way because I think indeed that would be an interesting episode because I've never done. It's quite a tool in lights. It's really great. Yeah. So perfect. Yeah. Send that my way. <laughs> I will also add also the episode with Remy Louf, which I think was episode 44, because Remy is one of the first developers of Blackjacks. And of course, we talked a bit about that in this episode. So if you are interested, go and look for it. OK, so awesome. Before letting you go, I'd like to ask you, well, what do you think the future of Bayesian stats in your field look like? And more specifically, what would you like to see and not see? I would like to see Bayesian stats to scale well the data. And I would like to see employing, doing stuff like, well, that's an idea that I'm saying out loud, like a Bayesian variational decoder or just using Bayesian methods in, uh, not fancy, in the new era of uh, other methods that they're cruder. So as I said at the beginning, I do probabilistic machine learning. So I wish them to use Bayesian methods to attach Bayesian methods to the new to the new style of uh, you know the so-called machine learning. So Bayesian GANs, not really. I cannot see that because of the philosophy of GANs, but Bayesian uh, variational coders that I can totally see that happening. For example, and in this case, we are going to use all the nice properties of uh, Bayesian stats and all the nice properties of variational coders. We are going to have the bottlenecks of both as well. But for example, the fact that it's an a pullback line that are approximate and we know that we go for the approximation and not the actual distribution. But yeah, that's the cost that might come at. Uh, so to be honest, I'm optimistic about science. I'm optimistic about research. I'm almost sure that in a couple of years, we will be using Bayesian stats again uh, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> and I cannot see why that would be bad. I mean, it, well, yeah. It is bad when you use something and you know nothing about the background, because then as a instructor of mine used to say, sometimes it is garbage in, garbage out. If you do not know, you really need to understand before using something, because sometimes you might end up in very, very wrong. You might start from wrong assumptions, ending up in wrong posteriors, wrong inference, and then establishing that as a claim, and that's a problem. Yeah. So that's my only concern is that people might overlook how important some methods are. They just are going to use them as black boxes, and that's not a good idea. Yeah, for sure. And it's always like a hard trade-off when you develop the tools yourself. Like it's definitely always something we ask ourselves in the PMC and our team is. You want to make things as easy as possible for people, but you still want them to think. Exactly. You don't want them to just push a button and not have to think at all. But at the same time, forcing people to think makes think make the tool harder to use. <laughs> But it has to be. Yeah. Yeah, I get you. I, I'm totally there with you because... You see the trade-off, it's like... Yes, yes. It's also why are black box machine learning models so prevalent? Yes, because it's the dominating way of doing stats at universities and so on and the way it is taught. But also it's because it's very easy and it's incredibly automated. At the moment, yes. So the user doesn't have to input a lot of effort and most importantly do a lot of choices which doesn't mean it's more always more accurate but it's often easier it seems easier to use and so that way you need also Bayesian tools that do that in a way but also don't force like but also kind of force the user to be self-reflective about what's going on. And that's a hard balance to find, I think. Yeah, I agree. But I definitely think that we should uh, keep on challenging people not to just put, push a button, but to try to think a little bit more. Uh, the fact that they are neurologists doesn't mean anything, you know, in the sense that, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, because some people sometimes they say that's not my job, so I do not know. So please, uh, you know, bring me a box and I will put the, the button. And the, no, no, that's, that's not how it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. They can collaborate. It's always. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand. That's hard. I find that like Paul Buechner and the BRMS team, they do a good job at that, at like trying to abstract away all the unnecessary things, but still making people think about the necessary choices they have to make to model. Yes, exactly. And that's the thing you want to do. And what they imply. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's definitely a, a thread I try to to be on each time I teach a workshop for uh, with PyMC Labs or in the, in, the, in the online course that we developed with uh, Thomas Vicky and, and Ryan Kumar. It's also something that it takes so much time to find that sweet spot, but I think it's really worth it. And that's very important. Yeah, in my opinion, we might just try to reinforce the notion of assumption. So just remind to the users what the assumption are. And then when that is clear and when they know what they know and what they do not know and how they model the things, I think that things get smoother. But they really, we really need to be sure of, you know, to have a common base, a common space that we agree that this is something that can be calculated. This is something that cannot be calculated. We assume a normal distribution here and stuff like that. So in my opinion, assumptions should be very clear. And then once that is clear and once the model is clear, then yeah. things should work smoothly. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Maria, we can call it to show before I have to ask you the last two questions as usual. So that was awesome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. So first question, as usual, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would stick to, the, you know, I would stick to the one I'm working at the moment to make healthcare <laughs> accessible from everybody and to make healthcare and to improve healthcare. From my standing point, from my, you know, a computer scientist slash uh, probabilist slash statistician, you know, just. So uh, healthcare is the thing that I'm the most interested about. Fascinating for sure. Second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? Well, it has to be too. <laughs> so it would be Alan Turing, who is my so much favorite person. At Cambridge, I used to go at his room and stand at he, the places that he would stand and felt like, you know, Alan Turing was here. To me, he's a proper hero. And uh, Christos Papadimitri was well, who is, the, um, you know, it's like his offspring. He is the father of complexity, actually, of complexity theory after Alan Turing. So I'm quite lucky I've met Christos, but yeah, I would definitely enjoy a dinner with these two guys talking. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it does sound like a very cool dinner, I have to say. Yeah, you see? <laughs> I hope I will be invited. You can join us. <laughs> yeah. Given that it's fictional, please do come. <laughs> Okay, Maria, that was great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot for all the, your wisdom about GANs and Turing clay processes and mixture models and generative modeling in healthcare. I learned a lot. I'm sure it was the same for listeners. As usual, I put resources and a link to our website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Maria, for taking the time and being on this show. This has been another episode of Learning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.